Well, welcome back to Talking Money, episode five. Happy New Year, Hannah. It's good to see you again after our Christmas and New Year break. Slightly eventful for you, I understand. Yes, Happy New Year, Martin. I am officially a COVID survivor. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And and welcome to the club. It's a good place to be. Um, I was going to tell you, actually, I didn't tell you before we started recording, but of the four conversations we had last year, three of them were in our top 10 most downloaded podcast episodes for 2020. So I think this format where you and I chat about different money topics is you know, striking the right chord with listeners, which is good. So let's keep it going and let's um, let's all see what we can talk about today. But that was really good news when I looked at the stats. We're going to get the morbid one out of the way first. We're going to talk about the cost of dying. And, and this is based on a new report. It's an annual report that comes out from the insurer Sun Life every year. And it turns out, who would have thought it, but actually dying is quite an expensive business, isn't it? It is. It's it's way more expensive. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm 28, as I've said before on this podcast. Um, very fortunately, I've never had a parent die or something like that, so that I've never had to be the one to deal with a funeral. And I hope I go many years without having to deal with that. Um, but it turns out, yes, it's a lot more expensive than you'd think to die. And this particular report is saying that now the whole of the cost of the funeral and everything involved is now averaging £9,000, which is just mm. extortionate. I cannot believe how expensive it is. Um, and that's a 42% rise since 2007, which again is is just absolutely crazy to me. I can't believe it can go up that much. Um, the good news, if if you can call this good news, is that it's the slowest rise since 2004. Um so I suppose that's the only decent thing to hold on to. Yeah, I think the problem the problem with this, the problem with dying, apart from being dead, of course, is um, that we, we don't talk about it enough. We don't we don't sort of uh, have open conversations about all the things involved, about you know our preferences for the funeral, whether we want to be buried or cremated, um, just the prospects. But I think this it's a, t- a taboo topic, obviously. You know, it's something people don't like to talk about. I think sometimes we worry that if we have a conversation about dying, it might become more likely to happen which is a crazy thought because it's going to happen to all of us eventually anyway but um this taboo subject maybe has become a bit more open in the past year because of the pandemic and we saw these um figures from the uh the ons in the last few days about excess deaths which is one way to sort of measure how many people have died in a year compared to a, a normal year an average year and it was the worst year for england and wales since the uh, the end well the, the onset of the spanish flu so 1918 worst year in over 100 years so de- death is on the doorstep it is um unfortunately and i hope that the excess deaths mean that those that are kind of these covid skeptics you and I have both had it we know it's real Mm. um but people that are very skeptical of it and argue that it's not real or it's just the flu if it was just the flu and and that's all it was and there was nothing more to worry about where would these 85,000 excess deaths come from so I hope that serves as a reminder to some that maybe are being a bit more flippant but you obviously as a financial planner I'm sure you've dealt with older clients and I'm sure clients have passed away before you've been doing this long enough is death a conversation that you have openly in the office or is it really tough for you even to bring it up in a professional capacity see I I have no trouble talking about it because I think it's you know it's a natural part of life Um, I've done some interesting things in the past around this so I've hosted a death cafe which is just the most incredible event to do and you you basically get a group of different people together you have coffee and cake and you talk about dying and death and your experience of it and everything and it's it's wonderful it's so cathartic um but it's just a real eye-opener what different people think about it. so i've done that in the past i've interviewed um a, a chap that founded a natural burial site so he's bought this fantastic meadow and it's you, know, you get buried in a wicker basket it's not too far from here actually and it's it's a wonderful wildlife haven but i think it's it's that topic that we should discuss openly with our family and friends certainly with our professional advisors so as yeah, so i've i've got no trouble talking to people about it and starting that conversation I don't always get the most positive response and i have to push a little bit and you know go gently where where that's sort of needed but it is a conversation worth having i mean one one of the interesting things i found in these these figures this report from sun life was the massive rise in direct cremations um, I had to look up that term because I wasn't particularly familiar with it, but it's effectively where the body is sent off to the crematorium and, and disposed of, you know, burnt effectively, cremated, and the funeral type 
celebration of life celebration of death is is held separately to that cremation event and i guess that's one one hangover from the pandemic that you know you couldn't have more than i think 30 people or even fewer at a funeral um so sadly difficult decisions were having to be made but it, this is one we need to talk about this is one that we have to have conversations with our family with our loved ones about and say you know what do we want when this eventually happens to us ultimately happens to us what are our preferences have you have you thought about it much i mean you're far too young aren't my, you? my own death um, <laughs> <laughs> what I'm, a question. I'm still i'm still too young and naive to think that i can't die and that i'm gonna live forever <laughs> and there are certain schools of thought that think i could live forever I, mm. I if i listen to elon musk perhaps i'll never die and i can be downloaded onto something i, I don't know but no in all seriousness to be honest i i really haven't my mum has talked about it before with me and she has always said that she'd like to be buried under a tree and kind of go back to nature which I, I think is quite sweet and maybe maybe that would be something that I would do to be honest I don't think I care really I've thought about things <laughs> like I I'm an organ donor I know I'm on the list and so that's that's important if I'm not using a kidney then for god's sake take it but apart from that I don't think I really care what happens to me I just hope that everybody has a really good time if I die and that there's a good party and everyone drinks a lot of wine because that's what I would expect from them and actually my dad has said um you know if if I go anywhere don't spend loads of money on flowers but do buy yourself a really expensive red wine mm. so I've got his blessing as I well I think I think that's good advice I mean I've had those conversations with my folks as well they've got it written into their wills um you know the type of burial they would like and likewise with mine uh, I'm not fussed about what happens to me after I go. If, if my body can be donated for medical science, um, I'm sure that they'd you know have some fun with that. <laughs> and that's absolutely fine. But yeah, not too fast. I think the most important thing for me and, and probably for most of the clients we speak to is making sure the people we leave behind are, are well provisioned for. So making sure there's insurances in place. You know, if I do pop my clogs at some point, I want Becky and the kids to be looked after and uh, you know, to not, not be in financial difficulty because I'm no longer around. Well, that, that's the thing with death, I think, that a lot of, I think maybe a lot of people, a lot of people must have thought about this, but I think it's actually so much worse when the dying is over, you know, and you've got over mm. whatever that is and you're just gone. I imagine it's an awful lot worse for the people that are left behind. And when I was reading some stories just around this topic to prepare from today, I read, I read some really heart-wrenching stuff about people that had become indebted to loan sharks because yeah. they they didn't have the money to pay for the funeral because not everybody has that money sat around and they have to get a loan or they have to ask some people to pay for it or they hadn't been able to be uh, they haven't been able to bury their loved one for months on end and I think the funeral and that whole process is really important when it comes to just processing grief mm. and imagine having this hanging over your head for months and months and months and not able to put the person that you love to rest because you can't afford to do it it's it's a sad state of affairs really isn't it but there is government help out there so that exists fortunately but again I imagine there is this these people that are caught where you have to be on certain benefits to get the government help. Yeah. But at the same time, there are plenty of people that don't qualify for benefits, but have low income, haven't got much in the way of savings and could suddenly be whacked with, you know, a £9,000 funeral cost. And they just don't have £9,000 in the bank. No. And so it's probably, a, it's probably a great, deal of, great deal of, sort of social pressure as well for many families to have a certain standard of funeral rather than sort of a very basic funeral or direct cremation to actually have the, the funeral with all of the bells and whistles and flowers and processions and everything else. And, and there's a cost involved. The resolution study did show this, that of the people where money wasn't left behind, where there wasn't provision made for funeral expenses, a, a very high number, I think it's about a third, were having to borrow money from friends or family or the bank or loan sharks in the worst case scenario to help cover the cost of that funeral. And that, as you say, it's just not, at, at a time when you're going through so much suffering and grief and, and you want closure to then you know, be reminded month on month of this debt, which is directly related to the funeral expenses, I think is yeah, something to avoid. So if, if there's this sort of research and this sort of conversation we're having now if this helps people to think ahead a bit and think okay i do need to now put some money aside for the future so my family you know well provided for then 
hopefully that's a you know a benefit of this report a benefit of this conversation shall we move on from that lovely morbid subject that we started with so topic number two this week is the financial services regulator the financial conduct authority has issued quite a stark warning about good old cryptocurrencies including bitcoin and my favorite line in this was be prepared to lose all of your money and of course, this has wound up all of these people who are evangelical and passionate about Bitcoin and passionate about how it's going to make them more millionaires. Um, what, what do you think of the warning? Was that a surprise to you when you saw it or you, you're expecting that sort of thing? No, um, not at all, actually. I, your, your listeners may have read my article about this. At the end of last year, I, I wrote um, quite a long piece on Nigel Farage and his new financial outfit if you can call it that that talks about bitcoin and when i was doing the research for that i found that on the fca's website it very clearly said if you invest in cryptocurrency prepare to lose all your money Mm. so i was like okay this is this is they're just now saying it to loads of people what's already on their website so i'm not surprised at all and it is very very speculative and very very volatile and there is no consumer protection this seems exactly like the sort of thing actually that's really easy for the fca to come out no sort of controversial opinion whatsoever and just Mm -hmm. say this is really risky don't for god's sake invest if you're not prepared to lose everything i think they're fair enough on this one yeah, there's there's two things about cryptocurrency. I think they call them crypto assets is their definition of it. But things like Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything else, two things that really sort of stick in my mind at the moment. One is the FCA has started registering um, crypto asset investment companies in the UK. And I think that was a bad move because as soon as you get that stamp on a company that says FCA registered, I think as a consumer, as an investor, you look at it and think, oh, great, it's regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. They've got teeth. They look after consumers. I'm protected. And what we have to keep in mind here is the FCA is only registering these crypto asset companies for the purpose of anti-money laundering. They're not registering them for suitability or conduct or capital adequacy or anything like that, any of the things that we're registered for as financial planners, but simply to make sure that they're not laundering money that they're not laundering money for terrorists or criminal gangs or anything so that's that's one element to it the other one this one really wound me up towards the end of last year is one of the reasons that bitcoin is shooting up in value is because a handful of institutional investors so asset managers and fund managers are buying bitcoin and one of the biggest moves at the end of last year was a, a company called ruffer uh, Ruffer, a big fund manager, they've got some fantastic ideas and communications. And then they go and buy, I think, about two and a half percent of their portfolio and put it into Bitcoin. And and I, I was really angry about this because I think that gives Bitcoin this sort of air of credibility that it shouldn't have. I don't think institutional managers should be buying and selling Bitcoin. It doesn't have any inherent value. It's not backed by any asset. It's purely speculative, as you just said. And yet, People now, individual investors are looking at it saying, well, Ruffer and others are buying it. The banks are buying it. Why don't I buy it? And then they're looking at the FCA registration and thinking, well, it's got the FCA stamp on it. It must be okay to buy it via that company. And of course it's not. And it, it, it scares me a little bit that I think a lot of investors, a lot of consumers are going to see those two things happening and they're going to buy into Bitcoin and then lose their shirts, as, as the FCA said, be prepared to lose all your money. So I'm gonna, I can rant about this for ages, because I think this is, this is potentially one of the biggest financial scandals we're going to see in the next sort of 12 to 18 months. Oh, really? Well, oh, yeah. well, I mean, I, you know far more about this than I do about the, how the technicalities of this work. Cryptocurrency is not a subject I consider myself particularly well versed in. It is absolutely an investment, if you can call it that, that I would steer clear of. I would, if a friend asked me about it, I'd say, please don't touch it with a barge pole. It seems like the sort of thing that people, people that can lose money, you know, people Mm. that can just take a punt on things and think, well, why not? Maybe they're a bit anti-establishment because that's, that's also part of the movement behind cryptocurrencies, this whole alternative kind of new system and that's i think where this evangelism comes from this whole if you insult crypto it's like you've you've insulted who people are as a person and it's and you don't know anything and and like you're somehow missing this big trick that's going on and i'm just sat there going what why this Mm. it's all so incredibly confusing to me but i do think people have to be allowed to make their own mistakes you know people if people want to invest in bitcoin 
they should invest in Bitcoin. But it's it's such a bad move, isn't it? Especially if it's not covered by any kind of financial ombudsman, financial services type compensation mm. scheme sort of thing. But you as an advisor, because obviously you pay into the levy that helps to pay out if consumers are you trying to upset me hannah into... by reminding me about that yeah i do uh, we've we've paid we've paid uh over five hundred thousand pounds to that levy in the last 10 years so it oh is, my what you what yeah. informed choice informed you're... choice has yeah yeah and oh we're, a, we're a small business and that's a lot of money um and it's and just to explain to any listeners or viewers who, who aren't familiar with this this is the financial services compensation scheme it's a government backed levy but it's funded entirely by regulated businesses like mine and when things go badly wrong, when uh, regulated and authorised firms fail, financial services firms fail, if there's a complaint and that complaint's upheld, then the financial services compensation scheme is used to compensate the investors, the customers of that failed firm. And the cost of compensating, this is the other fact I can give you, the cost of compensating customers in failed firms now exceeds the cost of regulating firms. So every single year, more is paid out in compensation via the FSCS than is paid to run the FCA. And that's been the case now, I think, I think two or three years worth of, of funding. And to me, that's, that's just representative of an entirely broken system where the regulation is so ineffective that the cost of compensation now exceeds the cost of regulation. Sorry, you wound me up. And that no, wasn't your no. <laughs> I, think, I think another point to add, because there will be people listening to this that think, oh, well, everyone's got money in finance and that's fine mm. and you can just pay out for it because the financial services industry screwed these people. I think when Martin and I talk about the levy, we're not... I, I don't think our hearts are going out to, you know, the huge financial services no, no. firms that, yes, it's a bill that they have to pay. But the problem is in finance, there's a lot of small businesses exactly like yours, that this cost is just sky high. Mm. But I wonder if if Bitcoin and all the rest of it and crypto cryptocurrencies in general, do you think the FCA will regulate them? And if so, that that could be another cost to look forward to. Um, I hope not. I think I think it will go one of two ways. I think it will either have to come into what they call their regulatory perimeter. So it will have to be regulated by them fully in the future, not just for anti-money laundering purposes, but for suitability and competence and everything else, capital adequacy. Or they will do what one of my peers, um, a chap from uh, West Riding Financial Services, Neil Liversidge, is currently petitioning the government for, which is to entirely ban cryptocurrency investing in the UK, make it illegal and illegal activity. So I think I think it can't stay in this sort of middle ground. It's still very new in relative terms. Um, it is attracting a lot of conspiracy theorists, you know, th- people who think that the real value of money is just going to be inflated away and because we're printing so much of it. Um, and sadly, there's so many conspiracy theories in the world at the moment that as soon as somebody latches onto one, they tend to then find the next one and the next one. And it becomes a bit of a bit of a disease of the brain. Um, so, yeah, I think it will go one way or the other to answer your question, Hannah. It's, it will either be fully regulated at some point or it will be illegal entirely illegal at some point i prefer to see the latter because as things stand it's the favorite currency of terrorist groups isis absolutely love it and there's evidence it was behind several major terrorist attacks in terms of the funding of it um it's very difficult to trace it's you know it's anonymous by its nature it should be banned in my opinion but as long as i don't end up paying compensation for it if i end up paying compensation for people who have bought into it and lost their shirts i will be very very upset and you will hear from me about that trust me let's move on before i get angry um the last the last one we were going to talk about this week was this research from the resolution foundation they've published a report called pandemic pressures and i think for me this was a good reminder that everybody's experience of this pandemic financially has been different depending on your situation, whether you stayed in work or not, whether you could work at home or not, whether you have children or not. And for us at the moment, that's a a new challenge we've had in the last week. Um, You know, Becky working very hard every day to homeschool our two here. Um, But but this report was interesting, wasn't it? It was was showing that there's been good and bad experiences of of the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, I'm not really surprised by any of the findings because I think the coronavirus has always been a story of inequality Mm. and unsurprisingly those at sort of the bottom of the financial totem pole have done the worst out of this i think that there was figures about job losses wasn't there that that a third of low-income children um 
a third of low-income families with children have had to increase their spending throughout the pandemic. And this is because of the cost of food and energy and entertaining kids at home, which is obviously not cheap, especially if you're getting things like school meals and you're being helped out in that way to suddenly have to feed everybody. It's, it's difficult. Um, it's confusing because it compares this with high income families without children, mm. which I thought was a slightly odd comparison that that didn't sit that well with me. I think if you're going to compare, then compare like for like, because yeah. obviously children are expensive. Um, ah, Here's the stat I was looking for. Low earners are three times more likely to have lost their job or been furloughed. And of course, if you're furloughed, you, you take the pay cut mm. during the pandemic. And even, even in my in my job at City AM, so I, I write about professional services, so your Deloitte, your KPMGs, your, your those sort of big audit firms that pay notoriously well, by the way. These are very, very well-paid jobs. Um, and they were sort of not whinging, but there was a lot of articles, you know, like, oh, partner pay has dropped by, you know, 17% or whatever. Mm. I'm picking 17% out of my head. I can't remember what the actual percentage is. And you're looking at these people that, yes, they, they, their pay has dropped, but it's like dropped from 550,000 <laughs> per year to like 512,000 per year. And it's, it's so, people are having completely different pandemics. Yeah. So excuse me while I play the world's tiniest violin for them. Um, it, it, the, the other figure in this report I found quite interesting was the higher income households. Um, the reason they seem to be doing so well from this pandemic, assuming they're still in work and they're at home and, and not going out and things, is around 40% of their usual spending is on sort of leisure related activities. So stuff we can't go out and do, eating out, traveling etc and this is why i think for the people in that position and, and you talked about inequality being the story of the pandemic and it, it absolutely is but for people in that very fortunate position they're not spending money on holidays they're not spending money on eating out or you know these normal leisure activities they're, they're sat at home you know maybe their biggest expense is renting a few more movies on apple tv or you know netflix or something it it it, it, it is a pandemic of two halves isn't it and and i think that was really brought into stark focus this week by the photos we saw on twitter of these free school lunches and then this campaign from marcus rashford uh, which seems to be making some progress now um yeah, it's, it's, I think we all have to remember and keep in mind that from our very privileged positions, there are a lot of people out there who are really, really struggling through this. Mm. And of course, the next question is, well, how do we fund all this? Because at some mm. point, this all has to be paid for. Um, the budget will go ahead, I think, in March. Um, and there's obviously been a lot of rumours. There's been rumours of a wealth tax. There's been rumours about people tax that are working from home i think that's mm. a terrible idea mm. um i hope the government come up with a way to tax people fairly i yeah. hope that a lot of the money can come from the higher earners because they have done the best out of the pandemic and so maybe they should pay the most back and, and i think one of the hopes is that once the economy opens up whenever that might be and the high streets open again that the people who have been sitting at home and saving money and paying off debts and putting money away in cash savings um, are able to go out there and have a bit of a splurge and just release that money into the economy, which will obviously help things if the economy grows. That will help to reduce the national debt as a share of it. So, you know, one thing the government can do is just encourage us to get out there and spend our money, but not just yet. We still have to stay at home and stay safe and, and not get this horrible, horrible virus. Yeah, I mean, I feel a little bit conflicted about that point because I think I think absolutely for people that are just, you know, they, they own their homes, they're very comfortable, they're sat on, they've got pretty decent assets anyway, to be honest, and they've just really benefited from not going out all the time and, mm. you know, not spending money in restaurants. I'd say, yeah, you know what, why don't you spend some of that money? But I think there's the issue for maybe younger people that they're not, living on the breadline you know they're not kind of working class people that have really suffered but for the first time this this has kind of offered younger people that are being they're, they're on okay wages but because everything's very expensive they can't really save any money mm. it's actually allowed them to build up some assets for the first time so what i would hate to happen is suddenly if you have people my age that for the first time are seeing four figures in their bank account because maybe they've been in debt and all this sort of thing i would hate to see them go out and splurge all that money on the high street for the sake of you know giving 
Miss Selfridge. Oh, Miss Selfridge gone. Not that anymore. Was, no, they're gone. They're gone. <laughs> uh, Debenhams. No, no, not Debenhams. No, um, <laughs> someone there's else. Got a, there's got, yeah, another one. One of the ones that, that's still fine. Um, you know, I'd hate to see them put that money, waste it straight away mm. for the sake of the high street, because actually I think it's more important from a personal finance perspective that people that aren't great with saving and weren't on the right track pre-pandemic but have been kind of offered this almost get out yeah. of jail free card for yeah. paying off debt I, I would actually so much rather they would put it in an ISA or they won't put it towards retirement I'm in my 20s I would never put it towards retirement but I know that you know they put it into a help to buy ISA I'd rather they do something productive with that mm. money and then you know they may if it puts them in a better position for later then that will benefit the economy in the long run. So I don't, I yeah. don't really want to see young people just throwing all their money away for the sake of the economy. But mm -hmm. I take the point in general that a lot of money has been saved by people that maybe didn't need to save it. Yeah, and maybe something that we can come and talk about again once we sort of know that things are closer to reopening is lessons that we can all learn from the pandemic and from the change the enforced change of behavior we've been through things we should almost try if we can to carry over into the new normal post opening but let's give that some time because i don't think we're they're that close sadly to um to the high street reopening or for the ability to go away on holiday just yet but we will be in time but hannah thank you so much for joining us again this week on talking money from informed choice radio i'll put links in the show notes which you can find at icradio.co.uk and until next week have a lovely weekend and rest of your week thanks martin <laughs>